Hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is Anish Shah on behalf of Weights and Biases again at MDLI here to talk about understanding the landscape of large language models. Now, all of you here today have probably seen the usefulness of the many tools out there that enable us to do things with these large language models. One of these such tools is ChatGPT. So um, as we can see, that ChatGPT is actually not the only application out there used by companies. In fact, Jasper AI, an up-and-coming NLP-based startup, and U.com, another search engine, both have their own variation of these chat GPT-like experiences where we can take in a contextual question and information and the algorithm slash chat GPT bot will go ahead and give you a meaningful response to do stuff with. So before we talk about these large language models, we should talk about necessarily how we got here in the first place. So a yonder ago, there were many models being made. However, only recently have we been able to allow ourselves to take part of the deep learning era of machine learning. And so in the most recent years, we can see that there has been a proliferation and gain of the amount of models by the various organizations with the various sizes and architectures. And as a result, we can see that there's a strong potential for newer, bigger, and better models to be made by various other organizations for various amounts of use cases and domains. With these large language models, we have to first look at what ex barriers existed in the first place that prevented us from previously being able to utilize these NLP-based models to its fullest potential. And so in this case, we can think of it as four different paradigms that existed between the times that we use each of these models. And so the closest one that we'll look at in this case are options C and D, which are pre-train fine-tune and pre-train prompt and predict, both of which we'll explain later. Looking at the basis of these large language models, we first have to take a look at the transformer model. From this transformer model, many other organizations built their own variations of the architecture that allows us to see the large range of use case available from these stronger architectures. And so transformer sort of the basis of GPT and things such as BERT. And so the reason why we tend to use transformers is the ability to align understanding of text to our concepts surrounding text. So in this case, for images, we can see that the highlighted area for the word dog represents a dog. And similarly, this generic architecture of using attention mechanisms within your NLP applications has become a really strong forefront that allows LLMs to exist as they do now. And so now that we're able to see that the usefulness of architecture is one barrier that we've passed, we can now see that with a, the stronger collection of hardware and data available to us to collect and utilize, uh, and the uh, assumptions and research done by uh, other various organizations to prove the usefulness of the two in conjunction, we can say that the large data that we needed for LLMs and the hardware needed to actually utilize the data architectures are now available and used simultaneously to get really strong increases in the efficacy of our models. And so you can see here that simply increasing our data and our compute has really strong repercussions for how well our model does. So because of this architecture and the setup that we have, we are able to utilize LLM for three generalized categories text understanding, text generation, and text exploration. So with text understanding, that is, as the name implies, understand and interpret our text to something meaningful with it and create an output. However, from text generation, we're allowing the model to use the interesting architecture itself to go ahead and gen generate its own unique content. And lastly, we have text exploration, which is the ability to use the understanding gleaned from the uh, model itself and try to dig in to understand how it got to that insight. And then from there, we can make our own insights that will help us better understand natural language as humans will and computers will. However, that isn't the only use of LLMs. LLMs have actually served as a great foundation for many multimodal applications, which take text and transform it into the other modality that we want. And so this can be text to text, text to image as with Dali text to audio as with dance diffusion, or text to video as with some of the stuff that we see from Google. And so 
taking a look at some of the organizations that Weights and Biases works with, we can see that a large, a large amount of companies are existing that are able to utilize these large language models and either build all the tooling around it or build the downstream applications that can work with them. However, each of these companies that you saw on this last slide were only successful due to their ability to properly train their LLMs. So training LLMs, as I mentioned before, can fall into a bunch of different paradigms. However, in this case, we'll talk about the ability for our models to be pre-trained and then fine-tuned in some form, either if that be through prompt engineering or through direct fine-tuning. So with pre-training a model, you may want to make one yourself or use an open source one and then build on top of it. Similarly, you may be able to adapt your model using various degrees of methods, which will allow you to specify for your own domain and use cases. As exists with every new cool technique and algorithm, there's his own degree of danger and scrutiny involved. So in the case of LLMs, LLMs have the potential to serve very nefarious purposes. So that may exist as such things as manipulating public opinion or censoring speech to uh, solidifying preconceived biases that were elucidated from the training corpus presented to it. To get ahead of the competition and these worries, each of these companies presented earlier utilize the right tools and processes that make sense for their organization, domain, and use case. And so weights and biases exist to help these practitioners utilize the right tools for their stack and ensure that they get the best out of their ML experiments while also making it flexible and easy to pass around any and all work that they do. So let's take a look at actually how we were able to help these other companies utilize LLMs for their use cases and domains. So not only with OpenAI did we help with their training of the GPT models, we also have a really strong connection to their tooling to allow users to fine tune on top of OpenAI extremely easily. More than that, other open source large language models, such as the ones made and trained by Eleuther AI, have created really strong insight and shared it with the world, utilizing weights of biases reports and hyperparameter tuning. Lastly, even in the domain of generative ML, do we see the usefulness of presenting public work to the world in the form of reports so that others can understand the underlying processes used for LLMs and be able to properly use it for their applications downstream. So before um, we had such tooling for our large language models and experimentation. This is kind of what research looked like. It's not bad, but it's not the most pleasant for any user. However, imagine being able to create these charts, but have it also be presented in a way that is very convenient for your team and yourself to get glean insight right away. And so that's what we aim to do with weights and biases to help make sure ensure that your large language models are optimized properly for you, your use case, and your organization. So if you'd like to learn more later about how to utilize weights and biases for your workflows, my colleague Thomas Capel will be teaching you how to iterate fast on to improve your baselines later today. Thank you.